Good evening. This is Political Forum for Wednesday, February 6, 2013. I'm your host, Dartesia Pitts. I'm also a board member of Can TV. And we welcome today our guest, Alderman Howard Brookins Jr. of the 21st Ward. Thank you for appearing on Political Forum uh-huh. today. Thanks for having me again. It's great to be here, as usual. Of course, uh, many of you may or may not know um, Alderman Brookins is a friend of Can TV. He comes all comes quite often. I would say often, right? I do. And um, it's always a lively discussion, and I always get a, an opportunity to sit and chat with him. Um, so this is always a treat. Um, we welcome your questions and your comments to join in on the discussion. Take the advantage of calling in and talking to Alderman Brookins, and you can call us at the bottom of your screen. The number's at the bottom of your screen at three one two. Seven three eight one zero six zero. So, Alderman Brookins, you are the Alderman of the Twenty First Ward. Can you let the audience know where that is? Sure. The Twenty First Ward is on the south side of Chicago, and the boundaries roughly are from Seventy Ninth Street on the north, and under the new map, Ninety Ninth Street on the south, the Dan Ryan on the east. And I go as far west as Damon in certain spots. Okay, so this is just for you to see it. This And this is the old map. Right, right? it's changed a little. So that little panhandle part that's sticking out is kind of cut off in the new map. Okay. And when, did, when does the new map go into effect? Well, it's t- by practicing custom, we will probably start servicing officially those people before the next... Uh, election. However, by state law, technically, it is uh, takes effect after the next election. Okay, so that's what 2015. 2015, so? right? Okay. So you, um, you're kind of serving a dual community. Or? Well, people. Some people are out there confused and not knowing, and um, y- people also received the the new voter registration cards, which technically had the new information on there. And so as to avoid any confusion, uh, me and most of my colleagues have been servicing people in both the old and new wards, whoever uh, calls we try and handle their problem as best we can. Okay. And how long have you been an alderman? Sure. I'm currently serving my third term, and it's been 10 years now, coming up uh, soon to be 11. Oh, wow, 10. It doesn't even seem... Yeah, time flies. Right. Okay. Well, what were you doing pre your office? Well, what, were you, I, what was your career prior yeah. to being elected? No, I'm a practicing lawyer, and I still maintain a, a, a very limited practice right now, but I've uh, been a lawyer since uh, 1988. I've been a state's attorney and a public defender and special assistant attorney general. I also went to school. My family owns a, a, a funeral home. I also went to school for mortuary science and funeral service where I was a licensed funeral director. Um, so I've done a bunch of jobs and um, a, a lot of things and know a little bit about a bunch of stuff. That's always good. So we were had an opportunity to chat with you prior to coming on the air tonight. And I, I asked you, you are the head of the Black Caucus or the alderman for city council. Right. And um, can you let the viewers know some of the things that the Black Caucus, what they do in general in any projects or any big Well, one, we come together because while we represent diverse parts of the city of Chicago, a a lot of our issues are common, like this crime issue has been a common refrain. Uh, Unemployment, the chronic unemployment in the African American community has been a chronic uh, refrain from all of the communities across the city of Chicago. And so we we come together to talk about our common problems and that the people we generally represent uh, have in common and looking for solutions. Um, one of the things that I'm proud of that we were able to accomplish this year is to get the uh, rental car companies at O'Hare and Midway, so the big three, and it's only three rental car companies that represent kind of everybody, Hertz and... Uh, Enterprise, and there's one other, but even though they're different brands, they're all the same people. Mm-hmm. Um, to, we negotiated with them where they will now spend $30 million of new money with women and minority owned businesses, and so we were proud of that. Uh, under the old agreement with these companies, they did not have to comply with the city's 
um, women and minority set aside program. And so we do things like that. We we come uh, and and uh, we talk to the mayor about uh, problems that we're having in obtaining certain businesses within our community. Many of you all know who may live on the south and west side that it's hard to. Uh, if not impossible to have family sit down style restaurants within the community and despite for example the number of African Americans that eat in places like Red Lobster uh, there's no Red Lobster in the African American community and so the mayor has agreed and we enlisted his help to help us get franchise and family style restaurants and other businesses to come to our community uh, and the mayor has actually started working on that and, and kind of cornered one of the representatives from the Darden group and told them that it was wrong and that they needed to rectify the situation uh, immediately. Oh, wow. We have a caller already. <laughs> Hi, caller. Hi. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Good. How are you? Okay. How you doing? I'm in Brooklyn. This is Adel Barksdale. Oh, good to hear yeah. from you. Yeah, I'm good. You look good hearing you. Speaking the real truth out there, because it, it, it's, it's long overdue. Thank you. For the whole, especially for the black community, because uh, they really in bad, bad shape. Unfortunately, we are as, I know, I, as, I know. A, as a race in bad shape, and we're suffering from unemployment, which is at least double that of the national average. And in some circles, they're saying that African American males in the state are unemployed to the tune of 50%. So what's your question, caller? Thank you. Oh, no question? No. Oh. Okay. Well, thank you for calling. Yeah, thanks. Good to hear from her. Yeah. Well, that this is a good segue. Um, unfortunately, Chicago, as you know, has been on the cover and, uh, and the headline of a lot of negative news when it comes to gun violence, mm -hmm. especially um, amongst our youth primarily. Right. And um, this is my first time having an opportunity to sit down and talk to an elected official, and especially the head of the Black Caucus, um, about this issue. How do you feel about? Well, I, you know, I can tell you, and on? and here I'll speak for both. Uh, okay. One, um, the Black Caucus members and myself b believe that uh, it, it's got to stop, and we as a community have to stand up and say enough is enough. Uh, we have yelled, screamed at uh, Superintendent McCarthy. We've voiced our concerns with the mayor. Uh, and while I can say it is more in frustration because we understand that they are moving resources around and trying to do uh, everything that they can to stop the gun violence. Um, but one of the things that we do know is that these punks are sleeping in somebody's house. They are staying on somebody's block. Uh, they are being fed uh, by somebody. And and we have to stand up and, 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 and stop saying it's somebody else and, and look, do some self-reflection and say, is it my kid? Is it my nephew? Is it somebody that's coming around visiting my nephew that has a gun, et cetera? And, and to stop that and, and to make sure we step up as adults and say we're not going to take this and that that is no way to resolve any conflicts you have. The other thing that we understand also is that there's lack of jobs and opportunity within our community. And a lot of this gun violence is fueled by gun, uh, uh, drugs and, and gangs. And so we have to, to come up with uh, situations and things for uh, young people to do, to get jobs, to have uh, opportunities, uh, whether they're recreational, but also employment. And I don't think until the community stands up and we get jobs, we're going to see significant decreases in the crime, unfortunately. Hmm. Well, I want to continue this, but we have a caller. Sure. Hi, Hi, yeah, um, I guess this is a little bit related to crime that you were just talking about, but I was just reading a little bit more about how they seem to be keeping these uh, cases of police misconduct and things like that. They're really costing to see a lot of money, let alone being a big problem. Um, I mean, how do you see that <laughs> developing or how do you see addressing that? No, that's been one of my biggest issues, and I've been uh, well outspoken with respect to police misconduct. And the reason is that there's an inherent distrust in the African American community towards the police, and a reluctance to come forward and report crimes and/or cooperate with the police. And in part because 
Uh, as you've seen with a lot of these cases, people who weren't doing anything, people who just called the police, ended up being accused of the crime. And so there's been a reluctance in the community uh, to cooperate. And you also know that many of the people who were locked up and were innocent, uh, were the police were aided and abetted by the state's attorney's office. Uh, we heard our current state's attorney uh, say on the 60 Minutes program, after uh, one of the victims of a, a bird situation was found to be innocent by DNA, that she refused to believe that uh, the person was innocent and said that the possibility of uh, necrophilia uh, precluded her from saying that that person was uh, totally innocent. And so it is those reasons and more that the my community or certain people in my community are reluctant to cooperate with the police. We got to stop that. A burge is a big symbol of, of the problem. And I said on the floor the last time we paid out some $30 million that Burge is still receiving his pension, even though the city continues to pay out millions upon millions of dollars to the tune of $57 million to date, and there are at least four more cases out there. Um, so, Carla, you're right. It's got to stop for a, a variety and a number of reasons. We have another caller. Hi, caller. Hi, um, Alderman. Um, first, I have just a comment. Oftentimes, we hear on the news during press conferences that um, crime in Chicago is down. And I just think that's very disrespectful in terms of the number of people who have been murdered um, over the past year or so. Um, I also want to know, there was an alderman who proposed putting GPS tracking devices on all guns. Are there other proposals circulating the council in terms of combating gun violence? Thank you. Good question, caller. The, um, uh, uh, most of it has been centered about policing, getting more police officers on the street, getting more visible patrols out there to deter the violence, being able to go back to some of the systems that seem to work under uh, Superintendent Weiss where he had more specialized units. Um, but the problem that we find ourselves in is that the city of Chicago can't regulate guns. Uh, we've tried that and that is one of the reasons that we are have been sued and um, the Supreme Court has, has spoken with respect to that. So any situation with respect to GPS on guns, et cetera, is really going to have to be a push from the federal and or maybe the state uh, government. Uh, yes, we support that. As you know, the city of Chicago has some of the most stringent gun laws in, in the country. Um, that's not stopping the violence. The, the guns are coming from other places and through illegal means. That's not to say that everybody should should have a gun uh, and there should be no limitations, but that says that uh, it's really a national problem and we got to get a hold of this at the national level to get the guns out of the hands of the criminals. All right, if you're just now tuning in, this is Can TV's Political Forum. I am your host, Artesia Pitts. I'm a board member of Can TV, and we have Alderman Howard Brookins in the studio with us tonight discussing and answering your questions, so I encourage you to pick up the phone and join in. Um, our number is 312-738-1060. And we have another caller. I like callers. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'd just like to have a comment. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm a senior citizen I'm from the South, and most of the uh, churches was involved with uh, the community and the poor people. I don't know why all the churches that we have in Chicago, none of the ministers and all the churches that we have haven't come forward to try to uh, reach out to these uh, gang members and, and try to get some of the young people in the church and try to give them some spiritual guidance and support um, besides just depending on the government and the uh, political system because if they got more religious by, uh, values, they would have more respect for the community. No, uh, caller, uh, I, I, I agree with you and to some extent, but I know that there are people like Father Flager who's been out there with the faith community of St. Sabina, and, and he is really doing as best he can. He's, he's, he's gotten in uh, professional uh, athletes to, to uh, play basketball and, and to really to try and mentor these kids. But I think that one of the reasons that the kids are disrespectful of ministers and authoritative figures is that 
a lot of these kids have not been raised in the church like you may have been. And we have to connect with these kids on uh, multiple of levels. And, and I think that you're right that there needs to be uh, someone in there uh, to stop them and to stand up and provide positive role models to these kids. But I don't know that we can lay blame on the ministers because a lot of them are actually out there trying to, to make a difference. Well, um, you were saying earlier that the symptoms of the gun violence is unemployment right. and drugs. Exactly. I, I, I think that the, the I mean, if these kids are, are, are getting these guns and they're obtaining them and we believe they're obtaining them legally, either they're stealing them and selling them, et cetera, but they're not working. And so the money that they're getting to get these things are fueled by the underground drug culture by and large. Um, I, I talk to uh, uh, many of, of young people on the street and, and ask them, and they would rather be working as opposed to standing on that corner and doing something else or selling something else, um, but they just don't have any opportunities. And so, so it's kind of like it's about trying to survive. It is. And, and we all know it's, 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 it's not rocket science that where there's uh, no opportunities and, and uh, high unemployment, there's generally higher crime. We have another caller. Hi, caller. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Alderman Burkus, how are you doing this evening? Good, how are you? All right. Uh, my question was if, you know, if they stop the drugs from coming in, you stop the guns. You can't buy no guns unless you're selling drugs. Until so that stops, the guns, you could regulate the guns, you could you could ban guns, but as long as that drug keeps flowing in the city, guns ain't going to never stop. No, I, 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 I agree and understand, and, and I've heard the statistics well, that there are about 30 million, uh, 300 million guns in circulation uh, in this country. Um, I, I do think that there are some things that can make it harder uh, for them to get guns, but I, I agree with you, caller. Uh, I wish the government would go further with respect to the illegal drugs and stopping or taking a radical approach of maybe... Uh, legalizing some of them we see that it it worked and it took out a lot of the violence with prohibition you don't see anybody shooting each other uh, machine gun style based on uh the sale of of spirits and liquor anymore and so something radical this has to be a new thought uh process with what we're doing out there with respect to uh drugs in our society uh i don't profess to know all the answers, but I know what we're doing right now is definitely not working. I do applaud the mayor in coming on board. One of the things that Danny Solis and I did was at least to allow police officers to write you a ticket uh, for having a small amount of marijuana as opposed to being forced to lock you up. Hmm. We have another caller. Hi, caller. Hi, how are you doing today? Thank you for taking my phone call. Um, my question is to the alderman. Um, I'm just curious, what, what is the Black Caucus um, doing because this violence is getting out of control? Um, it's been getting worse every year, and it's become a vicious cycle where, you know, in the streets we, we, we do the protests, we have the meetings, we march, and everything. Everyone tells us what we, what we want to hear, but then... A month later, the killings resume and everything gets back to normal. So what can we do that's outside the box that can put us in a situation where we can reverse what's going on right now? You know, I, I personally don't think it's the outside the box thinking. I think it's the inside the box and everybody take uh, responsibility for their house, their neighbor, their block. And we do it block by block and precinct by precinct. As, as I say, stated earlier... Um, these kids who are doing the shooting, these kids who are doing the killing, and, and w when we talk about the police officer, for example, that was shot uh, two summers ago now, uh, Officer Worthing, their mother overheard them saying that they were going to go out and rob somebody. People know what is going on, and we as a community have to stand up and say no. I'm not going to coddle you. I'm not going to accept that behavior out of you. 
And if you go out there and you're doing that, I'm going to tell. And until the community stands up as a whole, and it's not, oh, I can't tell on my brother, or my son, etc., or I'm not, I'm going to turn my head the other way, even though I know my kid is selling drugs, then the, the violence is not going to stop. We have to stand up as a community of individuals and say enough is enough. I was just thinking, um, I, you know, um, this is the, and that was a good question and it's a good right. segue. I would like to assist. How do you, you know, somebody was telling me, you know, go back to the schools and, you know, talk to the students and encourage them to, you know, think bigger and better and beyond. I might have, or go speak to them as a guest, or you right. might go and talk to them as a guest speaker. You may have them for 30 or 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really change their circumstance once they leave that. No, I, I agree, but... I've been surprised at the people who I never thought I really touched and I've seen them 10 years later and they mm -hmm. say, oh, you said X, Y, and Z and I listened to you and I heard it differently and I changed my life around. But I also want to encourage people is that nowadays we don't know the people who live on our block. We we don't know who our neighbor is. It can start there. And and the reason is, and I, I, I share this story with you, I I had a neighbor... And he was a hardworking guy, but when he went to work, his teenage son would act a damn fool. And he didn't know what was going on, but had I been somebody else and not knocked on the door and said, you know, when you're at work, your son is doing X, Y, and Z, he would not have known to stop the behavior. And so nowadays, many people are afraid to say anything to their neighbor because they don't know their neighbor. They don't want to get cursed out. They don't want to get involved, etc. We have to be like Miss Kravitz. We have to and be which. We have to be at that window, looking out at that window, looking out for our neighbor and saying what is going on on that block. And until we start looking out for each other, it's not going to stop. I cannot put a police in front of everybody's house 24 hours, uh, uh, seven days a week. And what is happening is the crime occurs, the police is there, you see him drive down the block, he's not going to come back for another two or three hours. That's when the stuff happens. Mm -hmm. So we live on those blocks. We can protect our own community. Uh, we can look out for each other. And this also goes to another, you know, comment that one of the callers um, called in to say about, you know, until you get rid of the drugs. Well, right. the drugs aren't just on the south side and or the west side. The drugs are uh, all, all over, over, but you don't see the same type of violence going on on the north side. So it kind of just makes me wonder, outside of caring about my neighbor, we have to care about our families, like you were saying, right. and start early because this is this is definitely an issue. But thank you for commenting on that. But I don't want to get you. I, I don't want to miss the other opportunities to discuss um, some of the new developments that oh. are going on in your ward. There are some um, exciting things that are, are coming this summer, and there will be opportunities. One, we have a Planet Fitness that will set to open this summer uh, near the uh, Walmart on 83rd and Holland Road. Uh, or 83rd and Stewart is commonly referred to. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a Chase Bank that will be built this summer also uh, on 83rd Street. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a private hotel that is coming mm -hmm. uh, to the ward, and the private hotel will service the uh, railroad engineers for like Norfolk, Southern, et cetera, and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. And so uh, those things are exciting. And also we have Reverend Jenkins who bought the, or uh, was gifted the Soft Sheen Carson L'Oreal oh, building okay. on 87th Street. And there are a lot of exciting projects that are going on there, his sanctuary, but also uh, restaurants and office space. And so I look for big things out of Pastor Jenkins. He's a dynamic leader and that's going to be a great project. Okay. And if... Your constituents wanted to reach you if they wanted to come in and tell you sure. about what's going on. How can they reach you? you it's a couple ways. You can dial 311 and ask for me or any of the aldermen, and they will connect you. Or you can reach me directly at 
881-9300. Our office is at 9011 South Ashland. And if you want to see me one-on-one -on -one in person without an appointment, you can show up on any Tuesday at 4.30. And I'm there from 4.30 to 7, meeting people first come, first serve. All right. Well, thank you. As always, it's a pleasure to interview you, Alderman Brookins. Thank you. Go Bye. NIU. Yeah, absolutely. College of Law. Both of us are alums. <laughs> and thank you for tuning in to Can TV Political Forum. Um, thank you to Steve for serving as our phone tech. And we will see you next week. Have a great night.